In this video, I'm going to be talking about the tetrahedral and octahedral point groups. And so these are the higher symmetries because there can be more than one principal axis, or I guess there's no principal axis because there are multiple that have the same rotational uh, symmetry. Uh, and so we end up with, uh, like the cube here, we can have multiple at order two, multiple at order four, and multiple at order three. And in fact, the cube ends up being kind of a model shape for both the tetrahedral and the octahedral, because we sort of inscribe these inside of a cube, which uh, I will show here in a little bit. And so we can see that this uh, two-fold symmetry here looks like this. So if we sort of uh, turn the cube up like this and we have our axis go into it right there and come out of it right there, that this is a two-fold symmetry, where if we have the axis like this coming in and out of these uh, corners that are far from each other, uh, then we end up with this three-fold symmetry. And then the fourth is when we just have a an axis going into the top and coming out the bottom and that has a fourfold symmetry on the cube here because you can rotate it four times 90 degrees each time uh, and so we see we end up with you know a lot of different axes here so we have three fourfold axes four threefold axes and six twofold axes and then we have these uh, nine mirror planes. Uh, and so we have to describe these axes a little bit differently. And so we will actually see something that looks like this. So uh, this these C3s with the three things uh, in the superscript here, the X, Y, Z. Uh, so I'll explain that here. Uh, so we also have it with the C, with the bar over it there. I don't know if you can see the bar that well, but it is there. So the C with the bar over it just means that uh, you're sort of rotating in the opposite direction. So if the C without the bar is counterclockwise and the C with the bar is clockwise. Uh, but then we see over here, uh, we have these superscripts and these end up having the little bars over them. So we have this one with no bars over it. This one has the bar over the Y and Z. This one with the bar over the X and Z. And this with the bar over the X and Y. And so that needs a little bit of explaining here. And so this one on the right here, so we see we have a tetrahedron inscribed in it. And so we see that uh, you know, it has the corner, the two corners on top and the two corners on the bottom here. And so we want to think about the threefold axes, which go from sort of the far corners from each other. And so we can think of one starting here at the, at the origin that I have labeled zero, zero, zero. And so we can actually think of an axis that starts here and then goes all the way up to here. And we can think of that as being our C3 with the X, Y, Z without any bars over the letters there. But then we can also think of this, an axis that starts at this corner sort of uh, in the back there coming up to this one. And so it's kind of coming from this bottom corner behind to this top corner sort of poking out of the screen. And so we see that in this the X and Y go to zero uh, as we go from here uh, up to this top corner there. And so we can think of that as having the X and Y with a bar over them. And so the Z is going from zero to, uh, to some positive Z. And so that is a Z without the bar. And then the X and Y with the bar over it is when the X and Y go to zero. Then so for the other two, <clears throat> We want to start uh, so sort of below this plane and then go to these two corners down here. So we actually start sort of up here for this one and then move down to that one right there. And so we see the X and Z are going to zero where the Y is going from zero to Y. And so that would be the X and Z having the bar over them and the Y not having the bar over it. 
Then we can do the same thing for this one, where we go from here down to this. Uh, and so we see that the y and z are going to zero. And so that would be like this one, where the x is going from zero to some positive x. Then the y and z are going to zero. And so those have the bar over it. And so we can do the same thing with the, uh, well, somewhat the same thing with these uh, these reflection axes. And so let's say we have uh, our origin right here, for instance, and then we have, uh, we have the x-axis going this way, the y going into the screen, and then the z going up. Well, we see that as we go along our x-axis, this plane is sort of going down. And so it's going up with x, so x is going up, but it's z is actually going down. And so what we would write for that is we would have a sigma, then we'd have an x, and then a z with a bar over it. Uh, where we see this other plane right here, uh, so the x is going up and the z is going up. So we would have a sigma x z, neither with a bar. Uh, then this one right here, we see, uh, so we are going x this way, y into the screen. Uh, and so this first one here, we have y going up uh, and z going up. And so we would have a sigma y z, where this, <clears throat> this other one that goes back here would be a sigma y z bar. Uh, and so then we have this one over here where we see that uh, this is going positive both x and y. So we'd have a sigma x y. Then this one right here is uh, a sigma, oops, that should be a sigma x bar because it's going in the minus x direction than a y without a bar. Uh, and so we see how that works with the mirror planes. And so that is how these labels will be done for this one. Uh, so here we can look back at the tetrahedron and how uh, this has these principal axes, well, it has multiple C3 axes uh, that sort of go into a face and uh, sort of come out at a corner here. And so we have these multiple C3 axes here. Uh, we have these C2 that go into a face and then sort of come out halfway between uh, down there along that edge. And so we have multiple of those going on here as well. And we have these improper rotations, these S fours here. Uh, and so the tetrahedral has uh, has inversions and S fours and things like that. Uh, and so we can see over here we have all these different sort of reflection planes uh, going on for our tetrahedral. All right. And so our first group is sort of, uh, I guess you can almost think of it as like a generating group. So it's the T group, this, the sort of pure T, is a subgroup of every other tetrahedral and octahedral group. Uh, and so in this case, we are using this, this uh, C2Z, so a 180-degree a, a rotation around the Z, uh, the Z axis here, and this C3XYZ as our generators. And over here on the left, I'm showing how we can get these other elements just using these generators. So the C3 bar is just the C3 uh, squared. Uh, so the C3 being applied twice. Uh, we can get the C2x and the C2y here using these, uh, using this and this here and so we can end up getting uh, all of these red ones up here and all these blue ones here. And then to generate these other six here we actually use the conjugate. Uh, of, so we take the conjugate of these blue ones uh, using the red ones. Well actually using this one as well. Uh, and so when we take the conjugate uh, of the 
of the identity element using uh, using uh, well we take the conjugate of the identity element using the identity element and we end up getting that because we're taking the conjugate of the blue column using the red row but this uh, this identity element is kind of playing uh, the part of both of them. Uh, and so when we take the conjugate of this one here uh, with this C2X, we end up getting this element. When we take the conjugate of that one with the C2X, we get that element and so on and so forth, filling out the rest of that table. Uh, and so this gives us the pure T group, which will then act as a subgroup of all of the other uh, tetrahedral and octahedral groups. So the first one is this TD group, which we use the, the subgroup T that we found up there and the left coset of T with this improper, this improper rotation S4Z up there. And so the way this table is, is designed is this this group up here, uh, or this subgroup, this row up here, is that T subgroup. And then these two down here are the left cosets. Uh, and so when we take the left coset of, of E with our S4Z, uh, we get that. When we take the coset of this C2X with S4Z, we get that. And so each column on this table uh, is uh, is either the element of the T or its coset with the S4Z. And so that's how this table is sort of uh, able to be read as these columns being either the element from the T group or the left coset of the T group with the S4Z. And so uh, the, the sort of quintessential TD group molecule is methane. And so we can look over here, we see we have our C2, uh, our C2Z up here. I uh, remember the C2Z was this one. It was the generator of our T group. So we have that one there. And we have our C3s here, which are the C3 XYZ, C3 XY bar, Z bar, so on and so forth. And so those are the rotation axes, which we can look at sort of <clears throat> in 2D over here. So if we're sort of looking down, uh, if we're sort of looking down at uh, one of these hydrogen atoms, and we have these other three hydrogen atoms sort of sticking down into the page, that gives us a C3 group. Uh, whereas when we're sort of looking down the Z axis, we have uh, this hydrogen and this hydrogen kind of sticking out of the page right here and here. And that gives us our C2 axis. And then we have these, uh, we have these reflection planes, these sigma Ds, uh, which go along these axes here. And so that gives us the sigma Ds we have in this sort of uh, first row of our coset. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the, we have our different uh, uh, improper rotations in that second row where it, the improper rotation. So you could think of, uh, we could move this over. So that's the C4 over. And then we do our, our, uh, our sigma H reflection, and that puts it down to there. And so that's why these are S4, because uh, it's using the C4 as, you know, part of that uh, sort of generator of the S4s, where an S4 is sort of equal to a C4 sigma H. Uh, and so you can think of this as kind of its own unit thing, uh, because this, this molecule doesn't have uh, either one of these on their own, but both together give us the S4. Uh, but anyway, that is the TD group there. Uh, so we can look at the TH group here. And so once again, we have the subgroup T in this top row up here. And then we take the coset, the left coset with the inversion, uh, where the inversion is the same as S2. And so we see if we take the coset of I with E here, we just get I. If we take I with the C2X, we get the sigma X. 
I with the C to Y, we get the sigma Y, so on and so forth, so that each thing uh, is uh, sort of, each coset item is sort of below its, the thing that is actually having the coset taken with, with the, the inversion there. And so that's how to read that table. And then so we get into octahedral symmetries, which, uh, so once again, we have these multiple different rotation axes so we have these uh, fourfold rotation axes and so we can see how this is sort of uh, it's the same symmetry operations as the cube here uh, I don't know why they put that there because that would just be the same symmetry operation as that one so these fourfold rotation axes then we have these uh, threefold rotation axes and these twofold rotation axes on the octahedral uh, and they are labeled the same way as with the tetrahedral because we're using essentially the square uh, or the cube rather uh, sort of axes or or uh, coordinates in order to label our our rotation and and uh, our reflection axes and so here so this is a still image but this actually comes from uh, this animation I have which shows all these different sort of octahedral uh, symmetry operations so we have the C4 here which uh, we can see just spins around in that way the C3 which spins around an axis going through these two different faces here uh, then the C2 which kind of goes through uh, one of the lines on here. Uh, then, of course, we have the vertical mirror planes where we're reflecting across here, uh, and we can reflect uh, across the one going, you know, along this way as well. Uh, we have these horizontal mirror planes, uh, so we can see how that is actually reflecting here. We have our inversion, and we have the S4 inversion, which is just a C4 followed by that sigma h so you can see that c4 happening then the sigma h uh, and so in the pdf that will be linked to in the description uh, these will i don't think these will all be animated but you can click this link and it'll bring you to the website that uh, actually has the animations on them if you wanted to look at them in a little bit more detail on your own uh, and so Again, with the octahedral, we're doing the same thing. We have our subgroup T, then we're just taking these left cosets. So this is the left coset with the C4Z. Uh, you can think of you know each thing being sort of below uh, its subgroup T element here. So each coset element uh, below the T subgroup element there. And then with the OH group, we're taking the the coset with the C4Z uh, and the inversion there. And so we're taking the T with the inversion, then with the C4Z, then with both the C4Z and the inversion. And so once again, each coset is beneath its T subgroup element. Uh, so each coset element beneath its T subgroup element. So that's why that T group is sort of important because it's used to sort of uh, generate all of the other groups in the tetrahedral and octahedral groups. And so this is kind of a quintessential, uh, kind of a quintessential OH group here. So the sulfur hexafluoride where you can see how that is indeed an octahedron. Uh, and so, yeah, that, those are the, uh, the higher order symmetry groups. Um, so I hope you found this video helpful and I will see you in the next one.